Welcome to the McCombs Leadership Forum, a conversation with today's leaders about contemporary leadership issues. I'm George Gao, host of the forum, and a professor in the McCombs School of Business and a former dean of the school. The purpose of these events is to give our students an opportunity to learn more about the joys and challenges of leadership. This forum is part of a course I teach in the McCombs School on ethical leadership. Later during the forum, students in my class will have an opportunity to ask questions of our guests. The McCombs School has a long and proud tradition of producing graduates who have gone on to be successful and ethical leaders. And our guest today is a great example of that kind of leader. Joining us today is a 1977 BBA graduate of the McCombs School who now serves as chairman and CEO of Southwest Airlines, Gary Kelly. Gary, thanks so much for being with us. Great to see you. It's great to be here, George. Thank you. You've had a distinguished 23-year career at Southwest Airlines. You joined the firm in 1986 as controller of what was then pretty much a comparatively small regional airline with about 5,000 employees. You became CFO in 1989, executive vice president in 2001, and then took responsibility for the overall company in 2004 as CEO. And now dealing with a national airline with 35,000 employees. As you reflect over that 23-year career you've had, what lessons have you learned and what, what skills have you acquired to make you an effective leader? Well, Southwest Airlines in particular, I think, uh, is um, just such a great company. Uh, and I think uh, the thing that I have appreciated the most uh, and have learned, I think, uh, the most about Southwest is just how important it is to be a part of a great organization. And uh, Southwest is one of those rare companies that is not just good at one thing, but, but is actually good at many things. And so in thinking about leadership and setting goals and, and aspirations, uh, one of the things that I've learned is that you can't just focus on one thing. Uh, at the same time, I don't think you can focus on a thousand things. Uh, but it's very helpful to have a balance uh, to be low cost, uh, but to also excel at customer service, uh, to be low cost, but also to uh, really celebrate people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think more than anything, that's what I've uh, not just learned about uh, in terms of leadership, but also really enjoyed. Uh, previous roles that I had uh, before Southwest were also very enjoyable, learned a lot, but there, was, there were, just wasn't the same emphasis on uh, care for people. And so I think that uh, more than anything is what I've, I've really learned the most about leadership at Southwest. There's clearly a very strong culture at Southwest that has been developed over many years. Um, but if, if you had a mentor, has there been a role model as you've gone through your career as far as a leader that you've really uh, learned a lot from and adopted a lot of what they did? Well, I think all, all of us uh, are, are the beneficiaries of, of uh, many, many mentors, and certainly I am. Um, 54 years old, the University of Texas was a great experience for me. And my first, uh, my first career opportunity right out of the box was with Arthur Young at the time, which is now Ernst & Young. And I had multiple uh, mentors uh, in that environment. And then certainly uh, when I joined Southwest, uh, I've been at a very young age. Uh, I started at Southwest at 31 years old uh, and had a number of people who tutored me. Certainly Herb Kelleher, Colleen Barrett. Uh, the, uh, the person that hired me was the chief financial officer at the time, John Dennison, uh, who is on our board uh, at Southwest Airlines now. So he's remained a mentor for me uh, you know, all these many years. But, I think the thing that came through the most with all of them uh, over uh, my uh, uh, many years is uh, just the fact that not only were they smart and accomplished in their own right, but they, they truly cared about me and my development. Uh, and uh, it, it was obvious and, and something that uh, just helped inspire me uh, you know, to work harder and, and to uh, excel. Sure. Do you think leaders are born or raised? 
in other words, is leadership really an innate skill that people acquire at birth, or is it really more a learned skill that, it, that people develop over their life? I, I think that there's elements of both, um, but I think as with many things with uh, people that achieve in various things, it could be in the arts, it could be in sports, it could be in, in leadership, there just has to be that desire uh, to be a leader, I think, and uh, then in addition to that, I think there has to be a willingness to learn what it takes uh, to be a leader. So it's not just something that you, uh, I think, show up one day and voila, you know exactly what it takes to be a leader. Uh, but I, I definitely think that there, and I see it in our own organization, we have 35,000 employees. There, there are many, many employees that are very capable and could step up and assume a broader role, mm -hmm. but they choose not to. Uh, for whatever reason. So I, I do think that there's a choice, but then you have to have the skills that come along with it. So I think it's a good blend of both. If you were gonna identify uh, particular factors that make a leader effective, would there be certain elements that you would just say these are the keys? Well, I, I like your emphasis on ethics. Uh, I think the, the word that I normally choose to use when I, when I get asked that question is character, uh, but I think the ethics ties in uh, dramatically to that. But uh, I was talking with a group of our employees yesterday, and I think the, the thing that distinguishes a leader from someone who is not in a leadership position is leaders have to choose. And I don't necessarily mean you have to be decisive. It's not that. You have to choose. You have to choose whether you want to listen to employees uh, or whether you want to pursue a certain course of action. Uh, you're the one who has to choose what the right set of expectations are for mm -hmm. the organization or for people. So I think it's just, just understanding that you have to make those choices uh, or else you really are leaderless uh, or directionless. And um, communication, of course, is, a, is a, uh, an overused word, but it is, leadership is about communication. And, uh, it's not mechanical. Mm -hmm. You have to have something to communicate, which I think requires a great deal of thought uh, and thoughtfulness. So um, I think it's a variety of things, but clearly character is at the top of the list. As you, you raise communication, and I know you've thought about the strategy and, and moving from being responsible in finance to, for 100 employees to now being responsible effectively for 35,000. I know you've thought about that communication strategy. What have been kind of the elements that you've wanted to make sure you adopted as you develop your ways of communicating out to this 35,000 employees? Well, I, I love being CEO. And, and of course, it's one of those jobs that you never know until you try it. Uh, but it's a pretty good gig. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I, I, as, as everybody knows, I'm an accountant uh, by training. Uh, I was pretty good at that. Uh, I enjoyed leading uh, a technical function like finance uh, all those many years. And uh, when I became CEO in 2004, it was rather quick. There wasn't an interview process. Our previous CEO decided to retire, and within days, you know, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm thrust into that role. Um, I felt like I was well prepared for it from a communications perspective because as you all would imagine, chief financial officers have to talk to a variety of constituents. You've got shareholders, the media, in, in addition to employees. But uh, it, was, it, it was definitely a different task. Rather than being a technician and talking about more technical aspects of our business, it, I moved into pure leadership. Uh, and it was a humbling thought because I can't fly an airplane, <laughs> I can't maintain an engine, I don't keep the books anymore, so you, you're sort of left with, well then what, what am I responsible for that only I can do, that no, none of the other 35,000 employees are tasked to do? And it's just pure leadership, and a huge element of that, of course, is communication. So I did decide on a routine of having written communications using different media. I'll, I have a voice line that I do. I do frequent... Uh, uh, interactions with employees in similar settings like this. In fact, I came from Houston today where I was having all-day meetings with our employees. So 
There's, God gave us two ears and one mouth, so I, I, I mean sincerely that communication, a huge part of that is listening to what is on people's minds and what ideas they have. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a part of the job that's uh, very enjoyable. Well, what motivates you? I mean, why do this job? What's kind of the motivation from your perspective? Well, I, and I think that's, uh, I think it, everyone here can relate to it. I think it is the, um, uh, the desire to excel, uh, whether you're in business, sports. Uh, it is a competition. We're trying to win customers. Uh, at Southwest uh, from other airlines. Uh, we're trying to be the best in customer service. We're trying to have the lowest cost. Uh, we're trying to have the, the best career opportunity so we can get the best employees. So the word best shows up often. Uh, and I feel like I've done well if Southwest does well. So um, I, I'm certainly living vicariously now through uh, the company more than anything. but. Uh, I, I think all of us uh, who like to achieve appreciate recognition, and not in the sense that I'm, I'm trying personally to win medals or trophies. I, I don't mean it in that way. But I don't think it would be much fun to do a job or to be a part of a team if you didn't truly like your teammates uh, and if they didn't like mm -hmm. you. So I, I, I think that that's an important aspect of that and, and something, as you well know, the culture of Southwest Airlines is somewhat unique. It is family-like, which implies love. Uh, and a lot of companies, of course, have um, a very sterile relationship with their people. So uh, I enjoy that, and that's uh, d definitely something that uh, uh, turns me on, if you will, in, in, in terms of being a part of an organization. Let's talk a little bit more about the culture of Southwest, because I think anyone who's flown Southwest will have stories about the employees, the fun aspect of it. Uh, if you fly at Halloween, people dressed in Halloween costumes. What are you going to wear this Halloween? I don't really know yet. I'm uh, very open for suggestions, by the way. Uh, as, as, uh, as the years go by, after you've done Halloween 24 times, you kind of run, run dry. But I think the number one suggestion on our uh, employee uh, blog is Harry Potter. So I don't, know if, I don't know if I can pull Harry Potter off. But. I think you'd look really good that, in, in that outfit. But you know, on the serious side, what also is so uh, noticeable about Southwest employees is they seem to go the extra step, extra mile, seem to go beyond their job description. And I'm going to give you a quick story, just from my experience. I was on a flight from Dallas to Austin that got delayed because of weather. And these poor pilots coming out of Oklahoma got delayed four hours, get into Dallas, delays out of Dallas, take us to, had to go to San Antonio because of weather, parked in San Antonio for a while. So a flight that was supposed to get in at seven is getting in at midnight, one o'clock in Austin. And so these pilots had to be exhausted. I mean, what they had been through. But one of the pilots, I think it was the, head, the captain, got off, went out into the concourse, because no one was there anymore, found a wheelchair to bring for one of the passengers. That, that pilot could have stayed in the cockpit, and no one would have thought anything less of him. But there's something about that culture. How did that come about? Uh, probably hard to explain. Somehow along the lines, uh, or along the way, that kind of behavior was endorsed. It was rewarded. It, there was ex an example of that. Uh, it's a 38-year-old company. Uh, I was 15 years old when I started, so the, the culture was very much embedded when I got there. There were 5,000 employees when I started, so we've, had, we've added how many since then? 35,000 total today, but the culture's still there. So it's an interesting thing to me, and I don't know that I can explain it. Now it would be very difficult, I think, to go in and uh, redact it, to ex extract it, to change it. I just don't know that it's possible. Uh, but we do share those stories. Uh, we do celebrate those kinds of um, events, um, but it does happen over and over. And you never know in life, you just never know when those opportunities are going to present themselves. Uh, I think one of the more poignant times, of course, for, for all of us, for our country, was uh, September 11th. And what happened, if, uh, if any of you were flying, you, you know what happened, but 
uh, the entire country was put on the ground in terms of uh, aircraft. So we had employees with customers uh, in places that we don't serve. And they did the similar uh, acts of kindness there where uh, our, our flight crews took out their personal credit cards, put our customers up for the night, bought them pizza, whatever it might take, uh, just so people could then figure out how they were going to get home uh, in the midst of their trip. So uh, those, are kind of, those are the kinds of things that you can't teach. We try to hire people with that kind of heart and that kind of common sense uh, and that kind of caring attitude. Uh, and somehow it's, uh, it's, it's worked all these years. The, uh, it seems like from a leadership point of view, there'd be a lot of advantages to being in a company with that kind of strong culture. But there probably are challenges with that as well. What are some of the challenges that you face having such a strong culture in a company? Well, uh, I think it's when you when you kind of think about processes and efficiencies, we're well known for that. We're the low cost airline in uh, in, in most years. Uh, we're we're in uh, in many ways. Uh, the envy of most airlines around the world in terms of our efficiency. I mean, you know, even to this day we have a single aircraft type. So there's a lot of things that we're very good at. I think when it comes to setting the right expectations for people, uh, recognizing that people may not be meeting the expectations, there is a risk that if you carry the family notion too far that leaders will misinterpret what that means. So you still have to be a part of the family, meaning you, you've got to meet the job expectations. Uh, so I think that those are some of the pitfalls. It's much, uh, when friendships develop, I think sometimes it, it might be a little tough to uh, reprimand your friend when that's necessary. Um, but otherwise, I think the, the strengths of the culture far outweigh uh, those kinds of risks. Sure. sure. Yeah, this, and you have a... a company has a great reputation of taking care of your employees. I believe you've never had a layoff yet. Is that correct? The challenge with that would be how do you balance taking care of your employees with your responsibilities to your shareholders for sh their investment in your company? How do you balance that? Well, it's a timely question. Um, you know, my goal for this year was to uh, not necessarily for have, to have Southwest be a hero uh, and turn in a record profit, it was in this kind of environment, we know that business travel will uh, be significantly reduced in corporate America. Uh, and there's really no easy way in the short run to offset that. Um, the, the only thing you can do is uh, keep fares as low as possible to make travel affordable for as many consumers as possible. So it, there's a real danger in a year like this, uh, and especially in, with the worst recession we've had arguably in um, certainly many decades, if not all the way back to the Great Depression, that uh, there is a risk of grounding airplanes, uh, having to furlough employees then. And we could, we could have furloughed employees this year. Uh, because we did find ourselves with less flight activity. Uh, but instead, what we've done for the most part is we've done really two things. We've spread the work out among uh, the, the employees that we have. So many employees are actually making less money, but uh, they're preserving jobs. And then we've offered an early, a voluntary early retirement uh, uh, program. So, we had already planned a number of initiatives to try to save jobs in the event that we got to uh, that unfortunate point, and so far we haven't had to do that. So in the end, I think what I would tell shareholders is that without great people, and especially in a customer service business, we, we, we won't have a good company. We won't have good customer service. We won't have the repeat customers. That's what ultimately leads to profitability. Uh, and it's a symbiotic uh, relationship. So uh, it's worked. You know, we're the only airline that's been profitable every year since 1972. No other airline comes close to that. So um, it, it's back to what we were describing earlier, that if we just focus on profits, 
I don't think that ultimately that is sustainable. But if we focus on having great people, offering great customer service, uh, a very reliable, safe operation, all of that combined should lead to a great profitability. Now what you didn't mention, and, and I know you took a pay cut yourself in these times, and, and you know the discussion that's going on in the country about executive compensation, particularly in the financial services industry, but in general terms. And I checked the, your proxy to just see what you're compensated, and you're, and you're not a pulper. I mean, not, they don't treat you badly. But quite frankly, you're not paid relative to your industry that high. Is that part of the culture of leading Southwest Airlines, to be closer to your employees in the terms of compensation? Or is it what causes that? And I don't mean to be your agent trying to get you a higher salary, but. I like the way you're going with this, though. Um, well, I, I, yeah, I think it probably is a part of our culture. The interesting uh, point uh, to elaborate on is that if you look at our employees, uh, our rank and file employees across all the operating groups, they are actually the highest paid in the industry. Our executives are not, uh, and that is by design. Uh, and many of us have been at Southwest Airlines for many, many years. We're there because we want to be there. We're there because we love the challenge, we love the people, and, and we love what Southwest stands for. Uh, so money is a part, but it, but it can't possibly be the... Money is not inspirational, mm -hmm. I think, is what one does, uh, and especially what one can do for others that, that, that's truly inspirational. So. Uh, the money comes and, and uh, comes along with that and uh, in, a, in an environment like this where our leaders were n nervous about this year and how things would uh, evolve, uh, we agreed early on that we would not have raises for our executives uh, but all the other employees have and I think that that's what leaders do is they just make sure that they take good care of their employees first. Right. Uh, 35,000 employees, and, and as you mentioned, you visit with a lot of them, you travel about, but you obviously don't supervise 35,000 people. And how do you establish the ethical standards that you want in the company, given you can't be out there supervising what, the behavior of 35,000 people? You know, that's, that's such a great question, and uh, it's just back to the humbling aspect of being a leader of a, of a large organization, because, because you can't possibly know everyone, much less supervise everyone, and know literally everything that's happening. So as a former financial person, uh, I, I obviously have a good understanding of checks and balances and controls, uh, so we have those. But it, it's really um, almost person to person. If, if I can surround myself with people that I think have high integrity, that I know, that I can trust, and we have the right checks and balances in place between us, then I would expect them to do the same in turn with, with their direct reports and, and so forth. Um, but uh, it's, it's not perfect. Uh, we have an internal audit department, we have a corporate security department, and uh, Southwest makes some bad hiring uh, decisions too. But uh, for the most part, I think it just, it's just one by one and having the right expectations, setting the right example, uh, and not straying ethically. Um, some of the bigger challenges, in, fa in fact, I would argue that the, the real challenge in business or in anything is dealing with people. Uh, you, you can figure out, you can figure out how to do the accounting. You can, uh, our, any any of our pilots would tell you, and I know you would all be glad to hear this, that flying the airplane is easy. It's the it because they are, they're skilled at that. They've got deep experience uh, in doing that, and the airplanes are masterfully uh, designed and maintained. It's the dealing with people uh, over and over and over again. So um, where they're and those are the real tests. When you know that someone uh, should be terminated um, because of inappropriate behavior, let's say, that's just a real test of ethics, quite frankly. And um, well, as unpleasant as it may be, 
there's a lot of people depending on leaders to make those kinds of decisions, and so uh, we hold each other accountable to, to make sure that we maintain that. As you mentioned earlier, your, your background is as an accountant, a CPA, and of course accounting has, accounting has a very strong ethical framework that, that they work with. Uh, have you ever faced uh, ethical challenges uh, in the sense of a situation you had to think through that, and figure out what was the right thing to do? And if you could give an, if there is an example that I thought the students would enjoy hearing about it. And, and we, we talked about that earlier, and I really did try to search through the memory banks there. I don't know that I've ever been in the real dramatic situation where I had to uh, uh, make such a, a hard choice. And, it, it, and, you, and you do make an excellent point. It is interesting, growing up as an accountant in Arthur Young, where ethics are so firmly implanted in your mind, um, it's just not difficult then. You have a great foundation that carries you through business, and it, and it really has helped me to this day. And it's not that I, f I found that others from different backgrounds or different disciplines had less ethics but it was just clearer, I think, uh, to uh, th those of us uh, from that profession. Uh, clearly being pushed on uh, numbers, to make numbers is the biggest risk ethically in that profession. And I was just fortunate that I, I, I never worked in an environment where I felt that. Uh, and again, it, uh, Herb Kelleher was uh, our CEO for most of my years at Southwest until I became CEO. And uh, I, no one has uh, higher standards than, than Herb Kelleher, you know. So um, in my Arthur Young days, lots of clients. Most of the clients that I worked with had very high standards as well. Of course, we're coming in there to check them. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, uh, I always felt like that they were, they were uh, on the up and up. And uh, I think most of the ethical challenges that I've faced have been more along the lines that I was uh, implying earlier, where you have a leader who uh, there are allegations of inappropriate behavior, which can run the gamut. Uh, and, and you all can guess the kinds of behaviors that people uh, get into. Uh, but you've got people that are in organizations that are dependent upon credible leadership. And uh, you, just can't, you just can't stand for that kind of uh, an example. So sure. I've had to make very difficult decisions there. And in some cases, without being completely certain of the facts, so you have to make a judgment. Uh, and, and, in, uh, and in those tough cases, again, I fell more towards doing what I felt was ethically right as opposed to uh, uh, maybe leaning too much towards giving somebody the benefit of the doubt. I've had the pleasure of getting to know your wife, Carol, and I know you have two grown daughters, and I know you're very close to them. But they were pretty young when you started up the career ladder. How do you deal with work-life balance kinds of issues as you were moving up and yet taking care of your daughters? Well, I think a lot of the pressure that, uh, that we all face in our careers is often imposed by others in addition to the, the, the pressure that we put on. So one of the things that I've always enjoyed at Southwest is that most of the initiative was expected to be derived from oneself. Uh, you know Herb Kelleher very well too. He's a very hard charging uh, a leader, uh, but, but never put a lot of pressure on me. So I was able to manage my time in a way that there was no guilt so if I had a soccer game that I needed to go to for uh, Caroline, I was able to make those games. So I never felt like I missed out on that. Now I might have to make up for it in some other way uh, if there was a, a significant uh, task at hand, but um, I would, all of us have to do that. And you just have to find some way to uh, balance that. Um, but I, I've had a, a great life, a charmed life, and uh, you know, enjoyed all, all my days as, as a dad, when my kids were at home, and uh, we're, we're, we're certainly enjoying being empty nesters too, that's all it's cracked up to be as well. But, uh, but it's, it's something that I do think you have to work at, and um, you, you, just can't, you just can't put too much emphasis one, one place or the other. You just gotta have some balance there. Sure. With two daughters, I'm sure particularly would be interested in gender equity issues. Well, 
what do you do at Southwest Airlines to help women get responsible roles in the company? You know, it's just such a great question. I, I have, when I was at Arthur Young, I came back to UT to recruit. I was one of the recruiting team and uh, always found it interesting uh, the, uh, the numbers of men and women. Uh, there were large numbers from both genders. Uh, there were outstanding candidates. Uh, and we recruited heavily uh, from, from both groups uh, when I was at Arthur Young. When I got into Southwest Airlines in the finance department, 75% women. Uh, and of course I have two girls. I'm married to a woman. I was working for a woman, so I was, I was, I was you know, surrounded by women which is why I'm so successful today. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I do think that it, the other thing that I've appreciated about Southwest Airlines is that we're not rigid and rote in how we do things. We try to treat everybody equitably and fairly, uh, but, there, but sometimes um, there are different needs by different people. And it does, you don't, again, you don't have to be wrote about, well, women need something different than what men need. But in, uh, in many cases, we've had uh, young women that we've hired into Southwest Airlines. They become mothers, and the demands on them change, and we have been able to adjust for them accordingly. The same could be true for fathers. It just so happens that, in my experience, it was mostly mothers. Uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that we've been able to adjust. And one of our vice presidents to this day is somebody that I almost lost because she needed a more flexible work schedule. Uh, and at least for us, we broke ground with her and said, well, how can we accommodate you so you can do both? Uh, and it's, it's just obviously a decision I've never regretted. So uh, we have a very feminine side of Southwest. I think that's part of our personality. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's been helpful that it was Herb Kelleher and Colleen, Colleen Barrett yes. co-leading the company. Um, and, and Herb said, so, so I need to make sure I give him full credit for it but because it, it's always stuck with me, that women can, they can excel uh, just like men in a business environment uh, and they can do so without ever having to give up their femininity. And that was just such a, an explicit recognition of diversity, that mm -hmm. people are different, and everybody can bring something different to the table. Uh, but we have a very strong leadership team, of which many are women. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head whether it's literally half or not, uh, but at times it's been more than half. Uh, and again, the president of our company uh, was Colleen Barrett for many years, right. uh, and a woman. So. Um, it, it's just something that, again, for, we're, we're lucky that we have a culture that uh, is supportive of that. It's nothing that I feel like we have to overtly uh, address uh, at Southwest, fortunately. Great. Finally, for the students here and those who will watch this, what leadership lessons did you do you wish you would have learned earlier in life? What lessons can you pass along to them that they should be aware of in the, at this stage of their career? Well, um, I, I think First of all, uh, life is a building process, and uh, we're both the, the sort of the cumulative effect of all of our years of experience and all of the influences that we've had, good and bad. And um, so it's it's hard to get to this point without having gone through all of those years, you, you know. But um, I've worked at Southwest so long now, I don't know that I could work anywhere else because it is so unique. Um, I've always enjoyed people. I've always enjoyed working with people. Uh, I just feel very lucky that I got with a company that truly cares about its people and it demonstrates it so many ways. In fact, before I came down today, I had a pile of thank you notes from our employees, various employees around the company. and. 35,000 people, everybody gets a birthday card. Everybody gets a condolence when something bad happens in their life. Everybody gets a celebration note when something good happens. Um, and people appreciate it. They will take the time to sit down and write me a thank you note because I wrote them a note. Uh, and it, it's just amazing the impact that it has on people. So more than anything, I probably wish I had known that when I was 30 years old, because uh, I clearly didn't appreciate that 
uh, at that age. But um, one other quick uh, note that was very powerful for me, we have a uh, quarterly leadership uh, meeting with all of our officers and directors. It's about 200 people for Southwest Airlines. And uh, we brought some soldiers in. And uh, it was all about leadership, you know, what, what made an impact on these soldiers. And they were recently returned from uh, Iraq. Um, and to a person, there was probably a panel of six from all walks of life. Uh, it wasn't how smart their commander was. It wasn't how accomplished, how many medals, how, what it, it was all describing how their leader cared for them. Uh, in a very intense environment. So uh, the word care just keeps coming back uh, to me more, more and more. So uh, if you can do that and truly, sincerely feel it, uh, you couple that with the skills and the desire, I think you've got a really good leader. Thanks, Gary. Well, it's your time, your chance. So again, we welcome questions and there is a mic over here and my students get the first opportunity so who's going to break in and do this? Here we go. OK. If you'd, again, queue up with Eric, that would be great. Go ahead, Freddie. Um, when you became CEO after Herb Kelleher, who's such a well-known, charismatic leader, was it difficult to kind of forge your own identity for yourself as a leader in Southwest? Um, and do you have any advice for anyone who becomes a leader after someone who is so well-known and charismatic. You know, and I, and I think tying into George's last question, that was another learning. Uh, you just have to, you have to do it to really experience it, to be able to uh, uh, answer that question. And I think it's, and, and we, we all hear this our whole life, but you have to be yourself. I had a great advantage in that I had worked for Herb for 20 years. So I knew him. I, I felt like I knew the company, uh, I knew our investors, I knew the other <coughs> officers. So I had a great advantage in understanding all of that. Uh, and they knew me. I was very well known with the media, with the investment community, obviously with their offers. The board of directors all knew me. So in that sense, I didn't feel like I had anything to prove. But they're all wondering whether I can really lead now as CEO. Um, so. You know, I do think that you have to fit with the team, you have to fit with the culture, but it can't be, it can't be so contorted out of shape that you're just not yourself. So I've, I've actually, I, and as you might imagine, I get asked that question often, uh, and I'm just very comfortable with, with, uh, with who I am, and it gets back, I'm not trying to win any awards. Uh, Herb is our legend, uh, and we've got the bronze bust of him in the lobby to prove it. Uh, he's our founder, and uh, we all adore him. And so, and I'm very comfortable with that. I think my um, my joy will be if Southwest continues to thrive, if we can have great careers for our employees, not lose any jobs in this worst of all recessions. Uh, I'll feel like uh, you know I've done my part there. So I'm very comfortable with that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine Wilson, and um, in the class we've talked a lot about situational leadership and how certain leadership styles fit certain situations. And I was just wondering, with Southwest having such a strong culture, do you think you would have been as successful at a different company with a completely different, you know, view on things? Well, I think uh, I think anybody who aspires to be a leader is just cocky enough to believe that they can do anything. <laughs> And I think that that is part of it, uh, and, I, and, I, and I do mean that uh, tongue-in-cheek. Uh, but yeah, I, I believe that if you gave me an assignment that I could do it, that I could learn it. Part of that, though, is recognizing that I can't fly an airplane, that that means that I do, part of my task would be I've got to get the right team uh, and keep the right team. So um, yeah, I, I feel like I could be successful someplace else. Uh, on the other hand, I don't know um, the enjoyment that I get at Southwest comes from many of the things that we've been discussing. If it was a different environment, 
I might get rejected from it. It may not fit me. So I think I would also acknowledge that. Um, the other thing that I think I would only know if I tried to do it, you can't go to the next place and make it what you had at Southwest. And I think we're all smart enough to know that too. You've, you've seen examples of CEOs, in fact, uh, high profile CEOs in, in, uh, in America who have tried to do that and they have been rejected uh, by their company. So understanding the culture and fitting in I think is, is very important, but I do feel like I'm, I'm, I'm flexible enough that I can figure that out and, and make that happen. I've worked in three different companies uh, in my career and all three very different cultures uh, and I feel like I've, I've been successful in all three. Thank you. Hi, my name is Danny Schumacher. Um, I was wondering, at Southwest, what do you think are your most important roles as a leader? Is it being a visionary or setting direction or something more technical? Uh, and again, speaking for me, I think it's less technical uh, I don't know that I would pick just one. Uh, what I do ask of our officers uh, is really two things. I try to boil it down for, to two things for them. And it's understanding that there's a, a, a layering process here that takes place. There's a foundation that uh, you, know, you can't just walk into an organization and say, I'm going to be the leader. You have to be competent, you have to, you have to know the company, you have to know the business. So all of that now is assumed when I answer your question. So layering on top of all of those basic expectations, I expect our officers to work together as a team. And you can interpret that as you all see fit, but I'm, I'm pretty friendly and pretty collegial and I like to be open. I don't like to hide things from people and that's what I expect of our officers. I expect them to want to succeed as a team and not to uh, be a non-team player. And, uh, and then secondly, I think leaders have to communicate. And there's a long list of things underneath that too. You have to know what to communicate. You have to be articulate in a way that people understand you. Uh, and um, I, I think you have to know also when to listen and uh, when, to, um, when to respond to employees' needs and requests. Um, so I, I think that those are all very important aspects for me. And um, you know, the, the, in the old days of being the boss and being a dictator and being autocratic and just simply uh, issuing orders from your office and never interacting with anybody, that, those days are gone. Uh, I don't think any of us can be successful uh, operating that way. And besides, it's just no, it's no fun. Uh, I think the, uh, the energy we really get is from being together, exchanging ideas, trying to get to the best answer. Not my, not what my idea that I had, but what is the best answer. Uh, and we have a great group of officers. Uh, so I try to foster that kind of an environment. Um, I. Uh, I definitely uh, am in a position where I have to provide direction for the company. It's, it's got to be me that says we're either going to add to our fleet this year or we're not. We're going to add new cities this year or we're not. Um, and so that's, that is clearly an important aspect of, of being a leader. But uh, you can do all of those things and if you don't inspire your people and you don't have a, a good team environment, you don't communicate, uh, it's all going to fail. So I think those are probably the two most important. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Siegel. Um, you've talked a lot today about you know the kind of culture and family that Southwest Airlines is and as CEO you just talked about how you know you're responsibility is to set the direction, um, but as most people know, families aren't always happy. How do you uh, kind of overcome obstacles, people who necessarily don't agree with your direction, and how do you convince them to um, go with you, or do you compromise? That, that, you know, that is a wonderful insight, and I think you, you, you put your finger on it. I think the word family implies that it's, that it's human, and that it is not perfect, uh, and that people do get angry, and they get upset, and they disagree, uh, and they might not talk to each other for a while as a consequence. So all of those are very real things that happen in the workplace. 
uh, and hopefully for legitimate reasons. And um, in a very difficult environment like we have in 2009, that is exactly what is taking place at Southwest Airlines. I have employees who are very upset. They've been used to working a set schedule for 20 years, and we've moved their cheese. They have a different start time. They used to have weekends off. Now we've moved their work to the weekend. Understanding that you know an airline is a 24 by 7 uh, lifestyle, so it is. Uh, it's a very challenging environment. People want to know why they have to make the change. They want to have the ability to express their view, especially when they deem themselves to be arguably a subject matter expert there. Uh, so I think allowing people to vent is a very important aspect of this. And you hope then that the relationships are strong enough that you can come back together, get all that off your chest and get it behind you. Uh, but uh, people get in my face and I let them. Uh, now I don't let them drop the F-bomb if I can <laughs> be permitted to say that. So they're, they're, we have to have a, a set of behaviors that we all deem to be acceptable. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't be passionate uh, and that you can't speak your mind uh, as long as we deal with everybody in a respectful way. Treat everybody with respect is one of the maxims that we have. Work hard, treat people with respect, and enjoy what you're doing, enjoy the people you're working with. If you can live up to those three things, most people are going to be very successful, I think. All right, well, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Bhargav Srinivasan. Uh, one of the things that we've been learning about in class is the difference between leadership and management. Um, and that leadership is quite a dynamic process. And while you're leading yeah. a group of people to an end goal, one of the things you need to do is make sure that you're dynamic about it and know when you need to change that path towards that goal. Can you give us an instance of when you did that with Southwest? Well, and, and first of all, I would endorse what you said. I, uh, the, the leadership and, and management is almost like art and science, and you, you do need both. Uh, it, it, it's not like management is a, is a dirty word, um, uh, but you definitely, you, you definitely need both. Uh, I think certainly recognizing the, the human aspect of what we do uh, and the example that I, that I gave earlier about recognizing that Sometimes you have to be flexible with people to keep really good employees, uh, and especially in the, in the example of the young mother uh, that, that, that I gave you. Uh, in, in terms of uh, flexibility, you, just ha you, we, you, you have to recognize also that uh, from the business side of things, uh, we can't control the environment. Uh, Southwest Airlines can't control fuel prices. Uh, we can't control the economy, and we can't control what our competitors do. And changes in any three of those, or any one of those three, rather, uh, will have a very dramatic impact, potentially, on Southwest Airlines. So we love to grow uh, and add airplanes to our fleet and add new cities. Uh, and we were forced to, to make some very significant adjustments beginning in 2008 because fuel soared unexpectedly to $147 a barrel. So uh, that's a pretty straightforward example of, of, of how we have to adjust in this particular year. We're very technology dependent and we're trying to create new capabilities for the future uh, in, in, in specifically so that we can improve the customer experience and be able to offer new products or features or services so we can make more money, uh, to be blunt which I think is a very noble uh, endeavor. And uh, we've had to restructure our work plan uh, just because the environment this year was so bad in the economy. We've seen our business travel as an example. In some weeks, in some markets, drop as much as 25 to 30%. And no business can, can sustain that kind of a shock to its revenue stream without making some kind of adjustments. So um, I think any business to survive, any manager or leader to survive, you have to be prepared to deal with reality as painful as that can be. Uh, the biggest shock, again, in, in my life was 9-11, where, where we were 
one day we were seemingly fine as a country, as, a, as an industry, as a company, and then the next day we were literally grounded. You talk about a mental adjustment. Uh, we didn't know when we were going to fly again. So um, it just, it always helps to be humble. Uh, it always helps to be uh, very well prepared for the unexpected. And it helps to uh, just, just be uh, graceful uh, and then just as fast as you can to deal with that reality and, and make adjustments. So in our business, we get more practice at that than I would like to admit, uh, but uh, it's just a very important trait, I think, to have as a leader. Thank you. Again, anyone in the audience who'd like to ask questions, feel free. Yeah, hello, uh, my name is Greg Lamas, and uh, throughout the forum you've really talked a lot about leaders having a strong desire to compete, and you frequently use the uh, example of sports. In our class, we've actually talked about the leadership styles of Coach K from Duke and Bobby Knight from the University of Indiana and then formerly Texas Tech. I was wondering if you have had any experiences with a Bobby Knight type of leader, or if you feel that a Bobby Knight type of leader could exceed uh, and excel in uh, your organization. Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that I can conjure up uh, a leader in, in my memory that really fits his style. Uh, and most people that played for him uh, love him. And so I don't know that I truly understand how he motivates his players uh, over the years. Uh, we, we all know sort of his public persona. Um, that's not what I behave like, I will, I will tell you. But, uh, and, and most of the uh, uh, mo of the many mentors I had, most again were very, uh, very intense, very bright, very accomplished, very results oriented, uh, but they were also very personable uh, and very caring. So it's it's it is, uh, it, it, you you can have all of those attributes. I guess just another learning that I had more with with Herb Kelleher than others. He's a very interesting character, as as George knows. Uh, he is, there, there is no one that I've ever met in my life who is more brilliant than Herb Kelleher. Uh, but he, he's also, there's also no one that you would meet that is more childlike in his enthusiasm for fun. Uh, and so he has a very wide array of emotions uh, and he's not afraid to reveal them. So I, I would just challenge you all not to let yourself get pigeonholed on what you have to be or how you have to behave. You can still be yourself. You can still have a wide range, uh, again, of, of characteristics that all come together to make you unique and, and make you uh, successful. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Elena Rosales. Uh, in class, we will be discussing the question whether leaders should be love or fear. And uh, since you seem to be a uh, leader who will prefer to be loved, can you tell us why, a reason why this should be the option? Well, um, I don't think fear works. I think most people, <coughs> you all are here because you chose to be here. You weren't forced to be here. If your parents said, this is what I demand that you do, you might follow it, but you might not. I mean, in, in the end, I think human behavior is really voluntary. So I would choose to try to inspire people as best we can uh, to do something because they want to, not because we told them to or ordered them to. And I think that's, uh, again, I don't think it's fair to Coach Knight to characterize him necessarily that way relative to the last question. I just don't know him well enough and know what his style is. But um, I think the days of trying to lead by fear are, 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 are over. Uh, I just don't think most people will stand for it. They want to be heard. Uh, they they want to be respected. And uh, nobody likes to be intimidated. So I just don't think... Uh, I've been married for 33 years, so it's kind of like a marriage. If you want to have a, a sustainable relationship with your customers, with your employees, 
you have to be thoughtful about how you're going to build and think about it as a personal relationship. How are you going to build that for the next generation? Um, people that are intimidated will be looking for the first opportunity to leave. The other fear that I would have, using that fear word again, is that that would get translated to the customer. Um, I, I can't tell you how many examples I hear of other airline employees who behave poorly because they hate their company. Uh, don't have as many examples for other industries, but I hear that one all the time, as you would guess, you know, at Southwest Airlines. So uh, all the great stories that, uh, that George and I could tell about Southwest, and hopefully you all have some too, are really because of a personal experience you had with one of our employees who no doubt felt good about themselves for some reason to be able to translate that to, to a customer. Okay. Thank you. And we have one last question. Uh, hi, I'm Gary Hoover, and if I can ask a strategic question. Uh, the airlines, uh, Delta and Northwest, have just made it, and you know that may set off a whole new round of new alliances and mergers, and you guys just went after Frontier and missed, and so if they if they go off and start forming bigger and bigger companies, uh, how might that affect Southwest strategy? You know, I don't think that our competitors combining to become larger in and of itself is necessarily an issue. It's it, it just depends on uh, which markets uh, and what the uh, uh, what the resulting competitive matchup uh, looks like. The, the industry is broken. If you go back to the Wright brothers and you look at the annual profits and losses, uh, the industry has a net loss and a staggering net loss. Uh, billions of dollars lost in 08 and, and billions are destined to be lost again here this year. So something needs to change. Uh, the, the barriers against consolidation are huge, as it, it sounds like you're familiar. Integrating labor union groups uh, is very, very difficult, just to name one. And then you have equipment types, uh, aircraft types that have to be blended. So there, there are a lot of obstacles to that. Um, we want to grow as an airline, thinking about Southwest. Uh, we're not opposed to acquiring another airline, obviously, by our interest in, in Frontier. Uh, we've we acquired an airline in the 80s, another one in the 1990s, and, and both of those acquisitions work pretty well. Uh, it's much easier for us to go hire our own people uh, that fit the Southwest culture and uh, buy our own equipment, develop our own markets, as opposed to trying to go acquire someone like Frontier and then go through the transition and integration process. So that would have been quite complicated for us. Uh, but it would have been, uh, you know, a, a lucrative opportunity had we been able to uh, make that work. So we'll be open to that ourselves. I don't think consolidation is necessarily a bad thing uh, if it happens with uh, competitors. Uh, most of the time, it, it will lead to less competitive seats. And, you know, by definition, a lot of our com competition is losing money because it just doesn't work. Our cost structure is half the legacy airlines, I mean, literally half. Uh, so we just have a very good proposition going forward to continue to offer low fares and be profitable. They can't match our fares and be profitable. So uh, in the end, I think all of that would probably lead to a, an opportunity for us to grow, uh, whether it's through acquisitions or just adding our own equipment and, and win more customers. That's typically what's happened. We've actually grown uh, this decade uh, by virtue of our competitors shrinking while we've been growing, uh, probably 60% compared to where we were at the beginning of the decade. So I would expect that that's going to continue. Uh, even if airlines don't combine, they're still reducing their flying, uh, and that's, uh, that's to our benefit. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Please join with me in thanking Gary for being with us today. Thank you, George. It's been great. Great. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And thank you all for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you at the next McCombs Leadership Forum. Thank you.
Great. Thank you. That was, that was fun. Thank you very much.